decided to settle down. I signed up for a job at the airport to do some undercover security, wandering near suspicious characters and listening in. I uncovered some incredible dealings with some Order of the Batch of Metals. I got married, had a mess of puppies, and now I'm just retired. The guy is amazed. He goes back in and asks the owner what he wants for the dog. Ten dollars, the guy says. Ten dollars? The dog is amazing. Why on earth are you selling him so cheap? Because he's a liar. He's never been out of the yard. <laughs> Thank you for your donations. Thank you so much. And thank you for your laughter. <laughs> Next week's presentation Bio 2 TU by Fernando Asin. I'm just making that up. Bio 2 is a sustainable. Sustainability education program that inspires sustainability-minded leadership, community collaboration through practical education, local opportunities, and replicable solutions. They provide educational resources that support the restoration of local environments through feasible solutions that leverage eco-technologies and that propose, promote sustainable entrepreneurship with communities. Ooh, that's tough to say. After 13 years of mobile education, educational program crisscrossing in Mexico and beyond, Bio2 is currently developing its first sustainability education training center, Lakeside at the, is it CETAC 01 Technical High School Campus in Hokotepec. Fernanda Austin is an international social entrepreneur with a strong passion for social justice and global sustainability. For the past 15 years, he has been studying survival for humanity from an indigenous perspective, traveling across the U.S. and Mexico to learn from scientists and academics and indigenous elders. He is the co-founder and executive director of Bio2, where he helps transmit their lessons to younger generations. That sounds like that's going to be a fascinating talk. Tell your people to come and hear about this. I love that it's being happening in Hoko. This week's presentation, David Roche, Roche, The Universal Threshold to Life, The Experience of Grief and Loss. We all begin our journey in a warm and protected space, the peace of our mother's womb. It would seem the Creator intended for that amniotic universe to be paradise. What is true, paradise or not, is we all get evicted. I remember that. No, I don't. David has come to see that loss is the sin qua non for the journey. We are born via traumatic loss. We are endowed from the first moment with our most overlooked gift, our breath. Each new breath is born out of loss. We come equipped with survival energies, pain, anger, fear, and love. Our learning the healthy expression of these feelings transforms not just paradise loss, but the constant of loss into a journey toward wholeness. David Roche began his work as a priest and teacher. After earning a master's degree in social work, he made his career as a psychotherapist. His postgraduate studies and passion continues to be the study of transpersonal psychology. He served as spiritual coach with hospice, and for over 20 years, he led experiences of liberation and empowerment as a certified grief recovery specialist. He is a certified infinite possibilities trainer. Please join me in welcoming David. the country and into other countries, and I credit Kermit with having helped me 
hang loose. You know how they do in Hawaii? Hang loose. Also, I'm a gardener. There are eight packets here, four in here, four in here, tomato seedlings and eggplant seedlings. Don't go home without one of them. You're welcome. So it may take me a couple minutes here to get settled. And uh, why didn't I tell you this story, seeing that it's 1043 and I was told I had 60 minutes up until about five minutes ago, I was told I have 40 minutes. So long ago, it feels like it was a past life. I was a young cleric, wet behind the ears. You remember that saying? And I was asked by a colleague to pinch hit for him. And I said, yes. And I arrived at this country church. And I was there early, and I got myself all ready. And I'm sitting in the sanctuary, or near the sanctuary. And it's seven minutes to seven. The service starts at seven. And I'm sitting there by myself. About two minutes to seven, this old farmer comes in, comes down to the first pew, and sits down. And I'm looking at him, like I'm looking at him. And he's looking at me, and now it's about three minutes after seven, and I'm getting a little shaky. I said, you know, sir, I'll be straight with you. I, I knew at this. And it's not worth it. To the old farmer, I knew at this, I'm not sure. It's just you and me. He said, Reverend, can I tell you something? I said, sure. When I go out in the field to feed my animals, and one animal shows up. I don't send them home hungry. Whoa. <laughs> Took a deep breath. You might want to do that too. <laughs> and I waxed eloquent. I dotted the I's, I crossed the T's, and when I got all through, I got to the back of the church to shake his hand before he could get there. And I'm shaking his hand, and he's going out the door, and I'm holding on to it. And I said, sir, are you hearing me, or should I speak into the mic? I said, sir, so you didn't hear anything up until now? Okay, good. Can you tell me how I did? He said, Reverend, I want to tell you something. When I go out to feed my animals, and one animal shows up, I don't give them the whole damn load. <laughs> so it looks like I have no choice. I just spent five of my 40 minutes. So I'm going to do my best to uh, celebrate the merry month of May together with you. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for being. I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for being here with me. I want to thank you for being here with me today. Providing me with the opportunity to parade my beauty.
How about that? Yeah, isn't that a mouthful? 900 years ago, Thomas Aquinas. That's the definition of work. We've come a long way in the wrong direction. I mean, I think I'm probably in a small percentage of men and women who happen to experience my work over 50, almost 60 years as parading my beauty. I love that definition. And I think that's the direction we all want to go in, too. And, of course, you don't get a paycheck for, don't always get a paycheck for parading your beauty. But whatever it is that you find fulfilling, whatever turns you on, whatever gets your juices flowing, that's parading your beauty. You with me? Okay. Congratulations. Why am I congratulating you? I'm congratulating you because you're showing up for a topic that is the most verboten on Main Street. I used to think it was death. Newspapers are full of death. But I submit to you, grief and loss ain't very alluring. And I am happy to report to you that after researching that for over 25 years, I happen to find it one of the most exciting topics there is. A total flip-flop. I spent most of my professional life as a private practice psychotherapist and trained in a wide range of therapies with a, a, a fair amount of postgraduate studies. Gosh Pavilion, I'm also very distracted. Gosh Pavilion. If someone told me 25 years ago I would choose to spend 20 years focusing intensely on grief and loss. I would have said, why would I do something like that? And once I got into it, I noticed that people had sometimes asked me, what do you do? I said, I'm a grief recovery specialist. And their entire demeanor would change. Like, oh. Grief is the normal, natural response to loss. Normal, natural response to loss. The challenges come when it's treated as if it were not normal. As if it were unnatural. I do want to share with you a five-point definition, and that's number one. Grief is the normal, natural response to loss. Following on that, let's take a look at loss. Law, and this, none of this is rocket science. Loss. We go to Merriam-Webster. Loss is the end or change to any familiar pattern of living or behavior. Wow! Very broad statement. The end, you're not wanted, not now. The end or change to any, oh, this is persistent. It's Beelzebub. <laughs> Let's 
see if I'm going to be able to pull this off. Maybe if I have a drink. I did a lot of that. And days gone by. Free! Free at last. I love circles. If I had my druthers, and I found out over the past <laughs> couple of weeks, particularly, even though I started a few months ago, boy, this Beelze bug is really persistent. I found out I don't have my druthers when it comes to LCS. But working within that framework, let me say this, we start out in the peace of mother's womb. Yeah, can't argue with that. And every single one of us got kicked out. Isn't I mean, isn't that a sobering thought? Our life journey begins with profound, dramatic loss. Let's put that over here. It is not possible to experience loss and not experience grief. And if grief is anything, it is feelings. You with me? If feelings are anything, they are energy. If you go away from here with nothing else today, Hold on to that word. That's the key to this whole shebang. Energy. And as a newborn, we're introduced to those energies immediately. Pain. Anger. Fear and the need for love. Not possible to come into this world in a good way and not experience those energies. And the sad part of the whole thing is that those energies have gotten a very, very, very unhelpful press. These are energies. There's no morality to these. There's morality to human behavior. There's no morality to pain or anger. And we ignore them. We push them down. We rationalize them. We intellectualize them. We call them something else. As Joseph Campbell might say, at the risk of great peril. I was married. I had a family that I said I loved. I was working for the Mental Health Association with colleagues that I said I enjoyed. I was working with severely emotionally challenged adults. And I said I enjoyed that work. Some people find the damnedest things rewarding. <laughs> and one October morning, this one of these beautiful days like we have 360 times a year, if not 365. Oh, pussycat is, is, he just went over the hump. Um, 
Where were we? I, I was not kidding when I said I'm distractible. Maybe if I have another drink. An October morning, beautiful day. Instead of turning left on the Garden State Parkway to drive to my office, I turned right. And I drove off into the wild blue yonder. Away from a family I said I loved. Away from work I said I really enjoyed and appreciated. No pre-planning. Five days later, only because a dear friend, first time in my life, that I reached out for help. And when I told him where I was, Alexandria, Virginia, I don't recommend it as a vacation spot. And I told him what was going on. It felt like a baby elephant had somehow gotten into the motel room and decided to sit down on my chest. When I told my friend that, he panicked. He said, David, put the phone down. Go to the desk. Tell them to call a taxi. Call an ambulance. You need to get to the nearest hospital. I said, Seb, I'm not going to do that. He got furious. What are you calling me for? I said, I want your help. He said, David, I'm 11 hours away. I was not only out of touch with my feelings. I was out of touch with reality. I said to him, that's okay, I'll wait. <laughs> but I can feel the pain of his love as I speak to you today, 40, 45 years later. And that pain has to do with his coming. Had he not come, I would not be standing here today. That's the power of pain, anger, fear, and the need for love. Energies. They are the dynamic level of the human personality. The word dynamic. Is the sound coming across okay? Okay. The word dynamic comes from the same root word that gives us dynamite. We're talking about dynamite. When they get ignored, pushed down, we can end up in a place, oh dear, I used up, I, it dried up. Maybe the black one will work. If I don't fall on my ass. I get silly. Okay. When those energies are pushed down long enough, and it's different for different people, there's 101 variables that go into it. But many of us end up where I ended up. Many of us end up where I ended up, a place I call Bob. Some of you may have been there. You know when you're there. It feels like you're falling out of the airplane without a parachute. What I am fired up about, if you haven't noticed, what I am fired up about is I have come to believe that one can free themselves from bottom, not just free themselves, but one can learn <coughs> to not just survive, but to thrive. And all 
she or he needs to do is tell our story. Come on, David. Tell our story? I mean, that's happening on Main Street. See, there's story and there's story. Story is not about talk, 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 talk. Story is about reclaiming our freedom. And that happens when story is expressing those energies. Most of us, if not say all, say 99%. Most of us have a historic backlog. Susie's puppy dog died. Susie's devastated. Her world has come to an end. And Daddy is holding Susie. Beautiful scene. Up until Daddy says, up until Daddy says, don't cry, Susie. Who of us here has not been told that? when we were little tykes. And 101 variations on that. If you're going to cry, you know, yeah. So we need to tell our story as a way to diffuse what I call historic pain and anger and need for love. When I turned right on the Garden State Parkway and drove off into the wild blue yonder, there was no premeditation. But it had something to do with this dynamic, with this dynamite. As we become freer and freer, and there's no limit. There's infinite possibility. But as we reclaim our nature-given freedom, we experience the freedom to do. And Let me just say, we recover our capacity to create, because that's what we're here for. And it's out of our creative doing that we discover what that great poet 500 years ago talked about. It's all about to be or not to be. And when we get that, there's a lot of joy and a lot of peace, and we're ready to go around. It's a spiral that goes on and on and on. You know about the big D? I want to talk about the little D. Big D, yeah. 
little d. The boy. Woohoo! Yeah. It's nice having a chill. <laughs> I had a client, we're doing our thing, thanks for, thanks for the morning, I take a drink on that one. No, seriously, I get along from, and thank you, I get along with a lot of help. Um, little D, we're doing our thing, and one of the participants, one of my clients, one of some 8,000 I worked with over, well over 20 years. Her name was Robin. I see her like I'm looking at Cab. And she said, do you, not just me, there were about you know, 15, 20 other people in the circle. Mm -hmm. You want to know what divorce is? Do you want to know what divorce feels like? Just like the big D. The only difference is, with the small D, you get to carry the casket around on your back for an indefinite period of time. Whoa. You never forgotten that. Adam, it's ten minutes to five, Friday. He's one of a 435 fellow employees who get that proverbial pink slip. Ten minutes to five on Friday. I want you to get into Adam's shoes. No warning. This happens a lot in the corporate world. Imagine the gall, 10 minutes to 5 on a Friday. Not just Adam, but, you know, a couple hundred others. Imagine what this man is feeling as he drives home. Imagine what his thoughts are about what he's going to say to his wife, his children. He's a family guy. They don't have a lot of savings. Robert and Joe are walking down the street, and Robert says to Joe, what's going on? And Joe said, I'm really, I'm really, I'm on the dumps. And Robert says, I can see that. What's going on? And Joe says, my puppy died. I want you to consider the possibility that Robert is visited by the thought. His puppy dying, and that's what it's doing to him? I'm grieving the death of my brother-in-law. I submit to you, I promised we find a point of definition, so I want to try to be true to that. One was, it's the normal, natural response to loss. Grief, too, needs to be, all grief, all loss, needs to be grieved at 100%. Thank you. Martin. Martin, thank you. His, his granddaughter lives next door, not like David's granddaughter, who lives several states away in San Francisco. But for Martin and for David, the granddaughter is the apple of his eye. And this particular morning, they have a contract. I mean, they live next door to each other. And Adeline, 
gets to spend at least an hour, one day a week, usually on a Thursday morning. This particular Thursday morning, they spend a lot of other time together, but this is like sacred. And Mama is bringing Adeline over, and they knock on the door, and Martin opens the door, Grandpa opens the door, and Adeline is jumping out of her skin. I mean, she's a very precocious and very vibrant child under ordinary circumstances. But today, it's like plus, plus, plus. So Martin says, you know, Evelyn, I'm so glad to see you. Uh, what's going on? And she comes in and they sit down and they're, you know, making a small talk and, and Martin brings out his precious coin collection, which is routine. And they play with the coins and Grandpa gets to talk about particular ones. So to answer... Martin's question, Adeline, who's jumping out of her skin, she says, Grandpa, Grandpa, look at, look at, look at what I, you know that real shiny coin? That one that was one of your favorites? Look at what I got out of the machine. You think Martin felt something? All grief needs to be grieved at 100%. And all grief we're talking about heart. Mary Ann, Mary Ann, don't lean on it. Thank you. Oh, you thought I was kidding when I said I get along with a lot of help. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's not just fun and games. I mean, I had a few bruises along the way. Where were we? Think. Heart, 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 heart. Mary Ann has experienced the tragic death of her 11 year old by a drunk hit and run. And Mary Ann's very loving, very caring sister, Helen, says to Mary Ann, Mary Ann, thank God you have another one. It's absolutely true. But where is it coming from? It's all about head or heart. And 99% of comments that just totally turn off the griever. They turn the griever off because they're coming from the head. You know, Charlie fell over a chair, somehow he broke his leg. Imagine if he's there. I know that's not the authentic one. Close. Imagine if someone said to Charlie, Well, thank God, Charlie, you've got another one.
you got heart and head. Yes? And you got energy. We talked about that earlier. Ener energy. I get up here, I get illiterate. Okay. Because we're dealing with energy, we've got the fifth point of the definition. And I can say I delivered what I promised. Because it's energy, it is cumulative. It wasn't that my puppy dog pooped on the rug that I took a right turn and drove off into the wild blue yonder on that October morning. It had nothing to do with puppy dog and the poop on the rug. It had something to do with 40 years of not knowing a feeling from a fig. I could use a different word. We're dealing with energy. You go away with nothing else. Because we're dealing with energy, it's cumulative. What happened when David ended up in Alexandria, Virginia, had something to do with a backlog. If I had time... This is a container, and you see what's in the, of course, right. My mother was not in touch with her feelings by any stretch of the imagination, but she did have a saying. You don't get your act together. I'm going to blow my cork. You know, there was Susie and Adam, and Robert, and Martin, and Mary Ann, and Robin. Remember Robin, way back 40 minutes ago? When those energies are not honored, they go somewhere. And there's a limit to what can go in here. Thank you. Do you get the point about the energy? Okay. I want you to know today is part one. Part two happens May 22nd at the Unitarian Church. And uh, I hope you'll show up. Um, following that presentation on May 22nd, Unitarian Church, there will be eight Wednesdays, two-hour sessions for eight weeks that will address all of what we talked about here in a way that provides a beginning, a middle, and an end. No money involved, no charge. 